good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, our Andy Armstrong Easter offering um, is coming up very quickly. Matter of fact, we're going to be taking it up next week, April 2nd, not on April 9th. We're going to do it next week, and the reason is because we have Todd Payne coming on the 16th, the week after Easter. So we'll be taking up the Andy Armstrong on the 2nd next week. Um, so be praying about how God will lead you in that. Also wanted to mention um, next week we are starting um, our food roundup for the NC Baptist Children's Home. Um, so that will be next week. I believe next week Barbara canned vegetables, correct? Um, so we'll be doing that boxes and stuff. So be praying how God's going to lead you to um, be given to these different missions and these different things. Uh, Easter is always a busy. April's always busy. Can y'all believe next week is going to be April already? It's just crazy. I don't know where it's gone. Everybody in there shaking their head like, I don't know what's going on. We didn't even have a winter. Well, we did back for about a week back before Christmas. But anyway, but be praying about how God will be, you, wants to use you in giving whatever it may be um, in the next few weeks on all, everything that we have going on. We are in part five of our series, Seven Signs, uh, from the Gospel of John. And we'll be in John chapter six again this week for this fifth sign that John records. We stepped away the past couple weeks through the leading of the Holy Spirit. My brother being here last week, kicking off. But today we're going to dive back in to sign number five. And Lord willing, the goal is on Easter morning we will finish this series with the raising of Lazarus from the grave. So let me quickly remind you of where we've been so far. If I was to give a theme to this whole series, here's what it would be. Jesus, he is Lord. Overall, we have seen in this series that what John means by intentionally using this word signs, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they use the word miracle, but John, he uses this word sign intentionally. And the purpose of the sign, think about it when you're driving around and you're going around, the purpose of a sign is never the sign itself. And there were so many people in the time of Jesus that were coming and they wanted to see the show. They wanted to see the signs. But the purpose of a sign is not the sign itself. A sign is always meant to point you to something else. And the purpose of Jesus' signs are two things. Number one is to point you to Jesus Christ. Most importantly, point you to Jesus Christ. And number two, the signs were meant to point you to a deeper spiritual tr truth for you to know and to live out. Sign number one, John 2, Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. Jesus, he is the Lord over our emptiness. Sign number two, Jesus from 20 miles away in John 4, he healed the royal official son, Jesus he is the Lord over our sickness. Sign three, Jesus healed a lame man beside the pool of Bethesda in John 5. Jesus, he is the Lord over our disabilities and our weaknesses. Sign number four, Jesus, at the start of John 6, took the young lad's lunch and he fed the multitude. Jesus. He is the Lord over our lack. He is the Lord over our insufficiency, insufficiencies. And today's sign, sign number five, is a familiar story to all of us. Jesus walking on the water. And I swear I didn't plan this. Me and Brad hadn't talked about the music much of anything. But everything that we've been doing and everything we've been singing and talking about today is leading right to this passage. We find sign number five right here in John 6 after the feeding of the 5,000. There are also parallel passages to this story in Mark chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 14. And I will be referencing those today. And here's the question that we must ask ourselves today. And some of you could really use the answer today because some of you today, you find yourself in the midst of one. Jesus, is he the Lord over nature? Is he the Lord over his creation? But more specifically in this story, is Jesus the Lord over the storms? Would you please stand as I read the text? It will be up on the screens. Or you can follow along in your Bible beginning in verse 15 of John 6. The text says this. 
Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea towards the pearl. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. God of all glory. What a joy it is to come into your house today. We thank you for the uncountable blessings in our lives. And we acknowledge our greatest need today. That is of you and your presence. Surely this morning... There are many today that are going through a storm right now. We all have them. And if we're not in one, surely there's a storm on the horizon. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning in the midst of the storms or the storms that are coming. Give us the strength and the encouragement we need to endure the storm as we rely on you and your presence. And as we leave this place today. Let every single one of us this morning be able to say that we have met with you and heard from you this morning. We have come expecting to meet with you, to hear from you. And let our hearts be willing and ready to respond to your word and your moving this morning. And if there's one here or in the sound of my voice that does not know or is walking with Jesus Christ, we ask that you do the work that only you can do. We love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Let me give you a quick background to where we come to this morning so that we can appreciate more of what Jesus does in this fifth sign. Jesus began his ministry and he called the first disciples to follow him. He began his public ministry at the wedding in Cana and did the first of his signs, the turning of the water into wine. He has gone to Jerusalem for Passover, where he cleanses the temple, his temple, and he has the conversation with Nicodemus in John 3. Sometime later, Jesus begins to make his way back towards Cana and in the area of Galilee and Capernaum. And he goes through Samaria to speak to this Samaritan woman at the well. And then in Galilee, Jesus heals the royal official's son with just a word from 20 miles away. Later on, back in Jerusalem for another feast, he heals a lame man beside the pool of Bethesda and claims very clearly to the Jewish people and, and the Jewish leaders there in chapter 5 that he is equal with God because he is God in the flesh. And it's somewhere around this time Matthew and Mark record this, that John the Baptist, he is executed by Herod, the Tetrarch. And so at this point, when John the Baptist is executed, Jesus sought to retreat by himself with the disciples for rest and a time to grieve. Rest because they had been traveling all over the countryside preaching the kingdom. And the crowds, they kept coming and they kept coming Wanted to see Jesus and see these signs and know what all the fuss is about. And so Jesus, he takes his disciples and he tries to retreat. And like I said a couple weeks ago, all of us, as Jesus modeled, all of us need time of silence and solitude with God. That are trying to get rest. They need time to grieve because John the Baptist had just been executed. I mean, this is the forerunner of the Messiah, of Jesus. This is Jesus' cousin. So they try to withdraw from the crowds, but they keep coming, and they keep coming, and this is precisely when the miracle, the sign of the loaves and fishes takes place. And notice what is going on here. Jesus needs to spend some time with the Father and the disciples. They're tired and grieving, but the crowds keep coming. The disciples... 
in, in the sign of the loaves and fishes. They're trying to figure out how to feed all these people at Jesus' request. Jesus, we don't know how to do this. We need help. And the crowds of people, they keep coming and keep coming. They're hungry. They need food. Jesus needs time with and comfort from the Father. The disciples need help from Jesus to figure out how to feed these people. And the people need to eat. In the middle of this, this is where Jesus performed sign number four and, John, and sign number five. The point of me saying all this, if any one of us was doing that, travel around the countryside and doing all this stuff, and, and we just lost somebody that we deeply loved and cared about, and the crowds keep pushing in, and the disciples need our help, any one of us would be tired and exhausted, and we'd be ready to quit. But it's in the midst of this that Jesus performs these two signs. The point of me saying all of this is very simple. Be assured today, no matter what, when you come to and call out for Jesus humbly, honest, desperate, and needy, Jesus will always answer the call. No one has ever come to Jesus Christ humbly, honest, desperate, and needy, and been turned away from Jesus Christ. Whatever storm you are in today, let those words encourage you. And be assured that when you come to Jesus in the midst of the storm, He will not turn you away. Amen? Amen. And we see this big time in the fifth sign today. Jesus walking on the water. First, what I want you to see from the text is I want you to see the unexpected helplessness of the disciples. Question. Have you ever had a plan and you are doing something and then all of a sudden you found yourself in an uncontrollable, unexpected storm? Amen and amen. And how many times could we say amen to that today? In Matthew 14 and Mark 6, we see Jesus tell his disciples to go get into the boat and go over to the other side. And notice the language in, in Matthew 14 and Mark 6 and here in John, John 6. They say it was evening. Darkness was setting in. And Jesus wasn't with them. They say a high wind arose. The seas are churning. And they are about three or four miles out into the sea. And me and Brother Jeff, we were talking about this earlier this week. Three or four miles away is a long way away from shore. Amen. Matthew says that they were being beaten by the waves and that the wind was against them. Mark says that they were making headway painfully. In other words, it's almost like they were rowing around in circles and accomplishing nothing. This boat is not motorized. The visibility, it's low. They have no GPS. They have no navigation. They are completely powerless and helpless. And the situation has quickly gotten out of control. Second, I want you to see the sovereign appearance of Jesus Christ there at the end of verse 19. I love this. Catch this. They're out in the sea and they can't make it anywhere. Mark 6, 48 tells us that while Jesus was up on the mountaintop spending some time alone with the Father, he could see them struggling from the mountaintop. Notice, his disciples are here. Jesus is up here. They're physically separated. But Jesus still knows their exact location. He sees them. And he knows the need. Listen. Listen to me closely, brothers and sisters. At times, it may be difficult to see Jesus. But be assured of this, Jesus can always see you and he knows your need in the storm. You see, I don't know if y'all have ever been to, me and Garrett will be going to here for his birthday coming up in April. We'll be going to a Hornets game. We're going to be going to a Charlotte, uh, Carolina Hurricanes game too. 
But one thing that they're doing now in sporting events and arenas is this. It's called the oblivious cam. Anybody seen or heard this? Nobody? It's kind of hilarious. Look it up. During the game, what they do is they turn the camera towards different people. They're sitting in the stands, and they post it up on the big screen. First off, I don't want my picture posted anywhere on the big screen. Amen? Y'all don't want my picture posted up on the big screen. Don't say a word over here, anybody. Oh, I heard that back there. Oh. <laughs> anyway, they post it up for all to see, and then they put this timer at the bottom, and they time how long it takes the person to realize that they're on the big screen. And so you get these people, they're talking. I think they've even had somebody asleep before. I think we might need to do that here at the church. What do you think? <laughs> on their phones. And they're completely oblivious to everything that's going on. People in the arena, they're looking, they're like, where is that person at? And they're laughing. Sometimes that person could be on the oblivious screen for a minute to two minutes. I'd be extremely embarrassed if that happened to me, wouldn't you? They're completely oblivious to what's going on. Brothers and sisters, let me assure you of this. You may not see Jesus. You may not be oblivious to where he is at, his presence. But let me tell you something. He's never oblivious to you. He's never oblivious to your storm. And he's never oblivious to your need in the storm. That's some good news today, isn't it? It's at this point, when they're in the middle of the sea, completely oblivious to where Jesus may be at. It's at this point that Jesus comes walking to them on the water. The disciples, the storm is raging. The waves are over their head and crashing on them in the boat. They're needy. They're desperate. They're helpless. But then you got Jesus. And here he is coming walking on the water in the midst of the storm. Oh, this is so powerful. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Even when things seem to be over my head, they're still under the feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. When this world seems that is completely out of control, be assured it is still under the sovereign control of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Third, notice the disciples' response there in verse 20. They were afraid because they weren't sure who or what was coming towards them. Matthew and Mark tell us they thought it was a ghost or a vision or a dream. So they were afraid. The storm was too much for them. And now someone or something literally is walking on the water coming towards them. <coughs> Hear me this way, <coughs> brothers and sisters. This is the warning from this story. Hear me closely. You should feel afraid if Jesus Christ isn't in your situation. You should feel afraid if he's not in the storm with you. You should be afraid if Jesus Christ is not in the boat with you. In this world, if you're walking without Jesus, you better be afraid. The Bible, God's word, it tells us that if we're living without Jesus in the boat, if we're living without Jesus in our lives, that if we don't repent of our sins and trust Jesus and follow Him, we're going to spend an eternity of suffering and torment separated from God in a place called hell. Hear me. If you don't know Jesus Christ today at all, you need to let Him in the boat. And if you are a Christian and you're in a storm or a situation and you don't have Jesus Christ in the boat, you need to call out to him today and cry out to him and say, Jesus, I need you in the boat. Fourth, so the storm's raging. Disciples are afraid. Now they're even more afraid because they don't know what the world's coming towards them. And notice what Jesus says in verse 20 and 21. Listen to the language here. He says, it is I. 
Be not afraid. Do not fear. Partially reminds me going back to Exodus 3. Moses is at the burning bush. He scratches his head going, Well, I see this bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. I'm going to go over here and see. Moses, take, take your stables off. You're on holy ground. Takes, us, takes them off. And then Moses starts giving five, five reasons of why he shouldn't be the one to go back to Egypt. And he says, one of them, why would they believe me? Who should I say is sending me to them? Lord. And the Lord answers, I am that I am. It is I, Jesus. I am not be afraid. It's the same language that we see in Joshua 1. Moses is dead. Joshua, you're going to lead people over. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. dismayed. For as I was with Moses, I will be with you, Joshua. I will be with you. It is I. Hey, it's Jesus. They recognize him finally. He's come to us. And what did the disciples do? They gladly welcome Jesus in the boat. And notice what is happening here. Jesus walks on the water to them. Jesus comes to them. They weren't looking for Jesus in this storm. Are you in a storm today? Are you looking for Jesus? Too many people today are in situations and they try to get themselves out of situations and out of the storms. But they never, they always forget. Even if I'm in this storm, it's all right. As long as I have Jesus. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus walking on the water to them. But once they recognized Jesus, they gladly welcomed him into the boat. And all their fear was gone because the wind stopped. You see, when Jesus is in the boat, there is nothing to fear. When Jesus is in the boat, there's nothing to fear. We started on Wednesday evenings, a new series this past Wednesday called Endure out of 2 Timothy. And one of the verses that we covered this past Wednesday was this, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. God hasn't given us and told us to be afraid in His presence. In His presence, we should feel the strongest and most secure. We have been given a spirit of power, love, self-control. We have been given the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit Himself. And because of that, listen to this. Because we have the power of the Holy Spirit living within if we belong to Christ. That means all of the resources of God are available to me in the midst of a storm. <coughs> and since that's the case, what else do we need? Absolutely nothing. So the disciples, they gladly accept Jesus in the boat. And as soon as Jesus gets in the boat, from Matthew, Mark, and John, we see three things that happen. Number one, Matthew and Mark tell us that the winds and the storm cease. You see, when Jesus is in the boat, when Jesus is in our lives, there is peace. Number two, Matthew tells us that they worshiped Jesus and said to him, you truly are the son of God. When Jesus is in the boat, when Jesus is in our lives, we will be doing what we were created to do, worshiping God. And number three, Jesus tells us that as soon as Jesus got in the boat, they immediately arrived on the other side. Did you hear that? They immediately arrived on the other side. <coughs> Listen, when Jesus is in the boat, when Jesus is in our lives, we will always reach our destination and there's no storm that can stop us. 
I'm confident, Paul says in Philippians 1 6, of this very thing, that he who began a good work in me will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says in Matthew 16, the gates of hell cannot prevail against his church. Amen. The devil, the world, and this crazy world systems that we live in today. They will do everything to try to beat you up and knock you off course. But when Jesus is in our lives, there is no storm that can stop you. There is no storm that can defeat you. You might end up with a black eye, but you will not be defeated and you cannot be stopped. The summary of this text this morning is very simple. We'll all go through unexpected storms. We'll all go through frightening things. But in the midst of these things, in the midst of these storms, Jesus sees us. He knows where we are. He knows what the need is. He pursues us and he invites himself into his, our lives. Jesus, he is the only one that can rescue us. And when, whenever we are under the stress of a storm, be assured. When we are under the stress of a storm, be assured that the storm is under the authority of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice in this story a few more things real quick. In this story, when does Jesus show up? Some of you need to hear this this morning. Jesus shows up when it's dark and you cannot see. Jesus shows up when we are helpless. When things are out of control and you can't do a thing about your circumstances. Jesus shows up when plans get interrupted. And Jesus shows up when no one else can reach you. And be assured today in the storm, Jesus is never too tired. He's always aware. He's always able to reach you. He's never weaker than the storm that you're in. And he's always aware of where he needs to take you. As I begin to close up, Brad, you can crawl up here. It might take me about 30 minutes to close up, but you can start making your way. Has anybody in here ever heard of an ether? Anybody in here ever heard of the ether? A couple people maybe kind of halfway shaking their head. Yes, most of you are looking kind of confused. What is an ether? Ether is an acronym for Emergency Indicating Position Radio Beacon. An ether is probably the most important thing that you want to have on a boat. <coughs> What it does is it sends a signal out when you're on the boat and it calls for help. If you're out in the sea or in the ocean and you find yourself in a desperate situation or a storm. You see, when activated, the ether, ether, sorry, it sends a distress signal out to someone like the Coast Guard or the Navy so that they can come and it gives them your exact position. So that they can come in your moment of distress. The problem, listen to me, brothers and sisters. The problem with the ether comes when the people on the boat don't activate it. Or when the people on the boat don't bring one with them. All of us. We're either in a storm right now. All of us, we're either coming out of the storm right now, or all of us, we may have a storm coming on the horizon. And some of you are probably looking at me going, brother, you don't understand. I've got about 10 storms right now. It feels one like one giant Katrina hurricane. Trust me, I feel the pain. 
We're all either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or there's a storm on the horizon. And some of you choose not to activate your Ephraim. You need to activate it. You need to call on Jesus in the midst of the storm. Come humbly. Come honest. Come needy. Come desperate. And when you do, remember this. Jesus always answers the call. He already knows where you are. He knows the need. He sees you. And he will never turn his back on you. Some of you this morning, you're in the boat and you forgot to bring the Ephraim with you. And you've never had one in the first place. Listen to me. You need Jesus. He's our only source of salvation. He's our only hope of rescue. His blood. And you don't just need Jesus in the boat. You need Jesus in your life. And without Jesus, brothers and sisters, there's much to be afraid of in this world. Do you have your ether? Do you have Jesus in the boat this morning? If you're in a storm and you're desperate and needy, it's time to activate your ether. It's time to call upon Jesus. He knows. He cares. He will never turn anyone away that calls on him humbly, honest, needy, and desperate. <clears throat> and for the others of you that don't even have Jesus in the boat with you, he won't be in the boat. He's wanting in your life. Will you allow him this morning? Why should we allow Jesus in the boat with us? It's very simple. Because Jesus is Lord over the storms. He's Lord over all. Is Jesus in the boat with you this morning? We'll be here to pray with you here in just a second. Father, we love you and we thank you. We ask this morning, Father, for your guidance and your directions in the storms. We ask for your peace and comfort. We ask for your strength in the storms so that we can make it through to the other side. Father, I don't know what all the storms are. I know there's storms in my life. We all have storms in our life, Father. But just let it be known to each and every person that's listening this morning, every person that's in the room this morning, whatever the storm, whatever the valley, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, you know where they are. You know the need. And you want to get them to the other side. Be with us and guide us. We love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. How can we pray for you this morning? Will you come?